Welcome to this module on the logical framework quick start. I'm standing in front of a somewhat large version of the logical framework and today we're going to set the basic framework. I'll share with you the structure of the logical framework, how to get value from it, some of the history, the four simple questions that enable you to begin designing your project immediately. We'll also illustrate it with a tongue-in-cheek and fun example which uh, shows the key points. I've taught over 25,000 people and guided over 1,000 uh, project teams in this process and they all love it because it is simple, flexible, and practical. So get ready, let's go through it. So let's go. What's the logical framework? Well, it's a practical project design tool. Structured as a 4x4 interactive matrix so the cells interact with each other. It organizes the answers to four questions which make it easy to get into. It has in, contained in it three directional logics. So we'll walk through vertical logic, horizontal logic, and zigzag logic. And those three diff different logics weave our project together into a strong project design. Structure of the logical framework. It has four columns and four rows. The first column is labeled objectives. And that's the most important one. That's the structural foundation of our strategy. We begin by setting a hierarchy of objectives. The next column is called success measures. We look at each objective and say, how are we going to measure it? What does success look like? And you do that in ways that everyone can agree. At the same time, we say, how are we going to verify that? What's the tracking system? How will we really know? How can we set up indicators, measures, uh, functions of quantity, quality, time, performance specifications, uh, so that we can set up and determine how well we're doing. Finally, assumptions. Assumptions are the wild card of the logical framework. These are the factors you can't necessarily control, and this is where Murphy and his infamous law live. There's four levels of the logical framework. Goal, purpose, outcomes, and inputs. And each of these has certain distinctions which we'll go into now. What makes this unique? Well, first thing, it embeds several important concepts that are missing from most other systems. Concepts from the scientific method, from management by objectives, from systems thinking, from project management, and from strategic planning. And it organizes them in a fairly interesting fashion. Second, it helps to bridge the gap between strategic intent and an actionable project. So many well-intended efforts fail because you can't make the link by, from the goals and the general kind of stuff to putting it into action and delivering in a way that really achieves the value that you're looking for. Third, it integrates some of the best practices and incorporates other methodology. If you're using Lean, if you're using Six Sigma, uh, this welcomes and embraces and strengthens the overall project. What makes the logical framework unique? Well, it embeds several important missing management concepts. You'll find out what those are as we go through this. It helps to bridge the gap between strategy, the strategic intent, the high-level stuff, and an actionable project. And it does it in a very elegant and simple way that you have a line of sight and you have alignment all the way up and down the organization and objectives chain. Third, it integrates some of the best practices. It incorporates other methodologies as well. So if you're using Lean or Six Sigma, that'll fit in here quite nicely. Whatever form of strategic planning, perhaps a balanced scorecard, that fits as well. It can be used as a standalone system or as a kind of a meta frame to organize the elements that you already have. So um, don't have to throw away what you're doing now. This helps to augment and multiply the effectiveness of your total system. Finally, it easily scales and adapts to virtually any situation. I have guided one-person projects, I've guided small team projects, project teams, departments, whole organizations. Uh, we've done this at the national level in several countries, and in one case, an integration of 11 different nations pooled their resources to do research and development, and the logical framework was the planning tool that they used. So one size fits many. Origins of the logical framework. Let me tell you a little bit about the history. It started out in the late 1960s when Congress asked the USAID, our Agency for International Development Foreign Aid Program, what are the benefits of foreign aid? Because we were loaning or giving away billions of dollars a year, and what was the return? Legitimate question. The thing is that USAID couldn't answer the question because objectives were too vague, there were no measures, and you had differing perspectives depending upon who you asked. The logical framework evolved in response. 
And I had an opportunity to work with the development team. I learned it from the masters. Uh, then I went and taught it worldwide in very interesting places in Africa, Asia, Latin America, the Middle East, the Caribbean, South America. And later on, I simplified it and improved it because I find in the private sector, you need a faster development time. So I had some good adventures or, along the way. This was my daily commute in one of the uh, countries. And by the way, camels are not as friendly as you might think, uh, but the gas mileage is good. I believe in the KISS principle, don't you? Keep it simple, Schmidt. So I've boiled down some very uh, complicated ideas into the simplest essence so you can learn them at the simple level and add more complexity, add more features, add more distinctions as you advance in your management and professional career. Four planning steps, four questions are these. And these are the, how you populate the logical framework. If you answer these intelligently, you'll have a good project design. First, what are we trying to accomplish and why? That's where we want to begin. Begin with the end in mind. Second, how will we measure success? What does success look like at each of the levels in the hierarchy of objectives? Third, what other conditions must exist? What assumptions are lurking out there, ready to trip us up if we're not careful? And fourth, how do you get there? Now, in my experience, there's a premature rush to the how we get there. I call that getting caught in the activity trap, getting on the road and driving uh, to meet a schedule before you really even know when you're going. So a little bit of time spent up, up front in questions one, two, and three are going to allow you to intelligently do number four. The questions populate the logical framework grid in an interesting way. First question, what are we trying to accomplish and why? We'll get a hierarchy of objectives in the first column. How will we measure success? Well, at each level, we'll define success measures and their verification. Because if you don't have a way to verify, it can't monitor, you can't track, you can't evaluate. Third, what other conditions must exist? What assumptions are we making that are necessary for this project? And fourth, how do we get there? And as you can see, those questions are somewhat color-coded uh, because I've coded all my materials to make it even easier. There are three directional logics we'll cover. And the intersection of these uh, makes the logical framework a tight system. By the way, it is not a set of boxes to be filled out. It's a dynamic interactive system. And if you saw some blinking lines on the original opening frame, uh, it almost looked like the logical framework is electric. Uh, that's because it brings a lot of energy to any team. The first direction is vertical. We define and align our objectives. Second direction, horizontal. We describe success and how we'll verify it. The third direction is zigzag logic when we incorporate critical assumptions. There's actually a fourth direction. That's the implementation logic direction. We'll cover that in later modules. I believe the simplest, most powerful, two-word essential concept in management is if-then. An if-then causal relationship. Now, you already understand this, especially if you saw a particular movie. Who is that? That's right, Kevin Cosner. The movie was Field of Dreams. Now, if you saw the movie, don't be shy. Just, just come along with me here and share the popular classic line from Field of Dreams. If we build it, then they will come. That's what I call an if-then hypothesis, a predicted relationship between two variables that we hope is true, and we're going to try to make it come true. In simple words, it's an educated guess. It's based on how we think the world operates. It's based on our judgment, our experience, as to what a successful strategy would look like. By the way, if you didn't see the movie, the setup was uh, Kevin Cosner, a poor Iowa corn farmer in the process of going bankrupt. And he gets this wild idea that if he builds a baseball field out in the middle of nowhere, formerly alive baseball players are going to rise from the dead, play baseball. He'll be able to attract fans, generate an income. So that's the setup of it. Hey, anything can happen in Hollywood. So let's go through the logic. It illustrates the key principles. And as we do this, think about how these apply to the activities on your plate. If we build it, then they will come. But what's the higher level objective? Well, if they come, 
then we can save the farm. So we have a three-level relationship here. Let's put some simple words on it. This is the what we can deliver. This is the why we're doing it. And this is the bigger picture overarching why, the strategic why. So let's fly those in. Later in, question number four, we'll talk about the how. What are the activity steps to get there? But we want to go through some intermediate questions first. Some key points. Projects have multiple objectives. My beef with the SMART goal uh, concept is they don't talk about the multiple objectives and how they're linked. They're at different levels in the hierarchy. So we need to organize them in relationship to each other. Applying if-then logic will help us to link and align so you don't have a disconnect between high-level strategic objectives and project objectives. And we're going to apply some very precise definitions at each level because that gives rigor. It, it provides clear, efficient communication. So key definitions according to Terry Schmidt. Actually, there's no official terminology in the management literature, so I suggest these words. If you have better words, go ahead and use them, but make sure everyone is speaking the same language. Goal is the big picture why. It's the context or the benefit that will come from this project and perhaps others that are part of this larger program. Purpose is a smaller why. It's the change expected at when you have finished your project. What's going to be different? All projects are instruments of change. Outcomes is a set of deliverables. Now there may be multiple outcomes, but they're the milestones, the things that you can put in place, the tangible results, whether it be a, a management system design, training courses conducted, uh, uh, something built, whatever it is, it's what's within your accountability and ability to deliver. And the inputs are the activities and resources to get there. So there's a logic. If inputs, then outcomes. If outcomes, then purpose. If purpose, then goal. Simple? Yes. So let's go back here and put these definitions in. Goal is to save the farm. Purpose, they will come. Outcome, we're going to build it. And inputs, cut the corn, plow the field, all that kind of stuff. Inputs, uh, activities are what you see on extended bar charts and work breakdown structures is a relationship between outcomes and inputs. And you can have multiple levels there if your project's real complex. So the importance of each level. Goal, aiming point. It's the big picture. It's what you dream to happen. The purpose, change expected after you walk away from the project. Deliverables, what you can put in place given good management of activities and resources at the input level. So the vertical logic asks the question, what are we trying to accomplish and why? And we identify what objectives the project aims to reach, the why and how. And again, as I said, that's the structural foundation. You use if-then logic. Let's take a look. The field of dreams logic, if we fly it into the logical framework, looks like this. With the if-then logic connecting all the objectives, the big picture why, smaller why, the what, the how, and later on in the detailed planning step, you can set up the who and the when. Typical uh, project management. The horizontal logic answers the question, how will we measure success? We want to clarify success in advance so there's no disagreement later so that we agree on our aiming point. The clarification using success measures of the objectives sometimes leads to refining the statement of the objectives as you get closer and closer. Sometimes planning is an iterative, incremental process, especially in learning-based type projects. And the logical framework supports that very nicely. And the success measures help us to articulate where we want to be in the future in a way that all can get on the same page. There's also the verification column which identifies the means to verify the measures. And that's real important, because if you can't verify that it's happened or not happened, it's not a very useful measure. So let's fly some in here. Uh, I like to start at the top, at the goal or purpose level, save the farm. Now, let's just say he was $100,000 behind. He had to pay the bank by such and such a date. Verify that by bank records. Great. Now, players and fans will come. Let's presume he's going to get into a league. So how many players do you need? Well, maybe 12 to 15 pro-level players. How are you going to verify that? Well, you can count them to get the number, 
but in terms of the quality verification of the pro level, you might have to do some, well, just check their stats on a baseball card. You also need fans, paying fans. So let's say that half of our income goes to expenses, the other half revenue. You need 20,000 fans who will pay 10 bucks each during a season. How do you measure that? Ticket sales. So we're starting from the top and building down. Let's go to baseball field. What you could talk about 90 feet between all the base paths and the pitcher's mound being 18 inches higher and the structure of the, of the diamond. Or you can return to and simply access existing standards, which we've done in this case, built to Major League Baseball standards, and seating for so many fans. Going to count the seats. Now wait a minute though. Is seating for fans a measure of a baseball field? A field doesn't have seats. So maybe what we're talking about, maybe what we need is a baseball park built. So that illustrates how going through the success measures will sharpen your understanding of the solution strategy to get there. Now the zigzag logic, this is what I like because it incorporates some of the external factors that are always there, whether we are aware of them or not, and that's where Murphy and his law live. So the question, what other conditions must exist, or if you want to restate it, what else must be true for this hierarchy of objectives to play out in reality? So the zigzag logic incorporates elements outside the project. I call them assumptions. And they highlight risk factors, interfaces, important conditions. In some cases, those assumptions are so important that we're actually going to manage it. We're going to bring it into what I call the stream of objectives or the manageable interest. So let's go back to where we left off here. Now what assumptions come to play in your mind when you talk about a baseball park built? What are some of them? And by the way, at the end of this session, please uh, access a downloadable, more complete logical framework that has a lot more detail. In these walkthroughs, I'll just give the basics and reinforce them by reading the actual project design. Okay, hmm, well, we have to be able to get permits. That's what I call a killer assumption. If you can't get permits, your project's dead. Uh, labor is available. Check into that. What kind of labor do you need? How much? When? Et cetera, et cetera. And if those, then we can have our baseball park built. So let's go to the next level. If, if outcomes, then purpose says that, okay, we have to have fans willing to pay 10 bucks each. Now that's something you might want to validate, verify with a feasibility or concept test before committing to this project design. Second assumption, the fans know about the baseball field. Well, of course they know about it. I mean, we talk about it all the time. But wait a minute, we're talking about bringing 20,000 people here. Is there something in the project design that will make that happen? Well, currently no. So perhaps there's another group that's going to do that, in which case you make the assumption that this other group spreads the word, and maybe you have to bring it into your project, which we'll do in this case. How do we do that? Add a second outcome. So we're putting an outcome in here called publicity program is successful in informing the fans, the measures there, all potential fans in a 50 mile radius have heard about it and been given opportunities, et cetera, et cetera. How would you verify that? A survey to see if you're reaching the audience. Okay, let's continue to cascade up. Oh, by the way, this assumption disappears now. We've handled it, we've taken care of it. So the assumptions column is a dynamic interactive thinking process that periodically through your project cycle, you're gonna revisit it and say, are those assumptions valid? What new ones have come up? So this is how you develop the ability to scan the larger environment, because that's where danger can crop up and if you nip it in the bud, it's not gonna affect you. So the next level, players and fans will come, provided that, some other things, and we're assuming here 50% of the revenue goes to expense, the rest will repay the bank. That makes our numbers uh, come out even. And by the way, if you're in finance or you're a number cruncher, you can do ROI calculations because return on investment is generally a goal and purpose phenomenon. Okay, we've done a preliminary project design and we've tested it. The implementation equation is something we walked through. It says basically, if we do these activities, and these assumptions are valid, we should be able to produce these outcomes. Now what that generates is a good discussion of, do we have the right inputs? Have we identified the right assumptions? If outcomes plus assumptions at, the, at that level, then purpose. And that generates the 
conversation about do we have the right mix of outcomes? Is this the right magnitude? And by the way, you can start with just one outcome and add later on if at the point you design it, you don't have sufficient knowledge. In fact, you can do a logical framework to figure out the best approach to a complex project. I call that a pre-log frame. We'll talk about that later. And if purpose and assumptions will reach a goal. Now at this level, the assumptions column often identifies the contribution of other projects. If it's a larger structure, it may be just your project alone contributing to this, but often we have multiple things uh, affecting the goal level objective. So some of the benefits. Primary benefit, it's a common sense approach that makes things clear to all. And you don't have to have a sophisticated background and years of experience if you just rely on common sense. But it structures that common sense. One of the first compliments I got was in Bangladesh when a planner that I was working with said, this system is so simple that everyone from the Minister of Agriculture to the farmer in the field to the implementing agents can get on the same page and make the projects work. I agree. I've heard similar statements in corporate environments. This is so simple that the project team, the sponsor, the CEO, all the stakeholders can get on the same page. And that's the primary benefit. Because you have clarity of strategy and a shared approach, you have a good chance of succeeding. It improves the project design. It will shore up the weak areas. It will give you more confidence that the approach you're taking is the right approach. It makes a distinction between what we can from what we hope to achieve. We can deliver outcomes. That's the definition of outcomes. We can make them happen. What we hope to achieve will be a predicted result of that outcome set. It establishes accountability. Project teams are accountable for delivering outcomes designed to achieve purpose. And there are some other things, so I put a what else there. I encourage you to think about, from your own perspective, how would this help you? And to send me your ideas, uh, projectaccelerateNow at gmail.com. And in a future episode, I'll share all the feedback and some of the benefits that, uh, that you have identified. So until the next session, uh, think about this. There's some application uh, topics in your downloadable notes. And we'll see you soon.